Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Dr. Sebastian Morello. He's returning again to talk about the life and philosophy of Sir Roger Scruton. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Morello, thank you so much for joining me again. Uh, tell me, uh, have you been, you know, has any, have you published any new books or any new articles lately or, you know, what's going on in your life right now? Well, I've been doing uh, quite a lot of uh, popular articles and things like that uh, since um, the world as God's icon uh, came out. And um, I'm actually about to cross the pond and, uh, and, and uh, join your neck of the woods. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, no, I'm going to New Jersey. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm uh, in, in a, well, it must be about six weeks now. I'm taking up a post at Princeton. Um, so hopefully I will, um, uh, I've got, I've got a, br uh, a book in store, a very big book, which uh, I've been writing, um, which is now finished. And uh, I hope to hand that to Princeton University Press and convince them that it's worth publishing. Um, so that's 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 what's next. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, a very different to the last one, which, as you know, was on uh, theocentric uh, uh, metaphysics and uh, the possibility of developing an aesthetic theory out of that. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 forthcoming book. Um, uh, whoever publishes it in the end uh, is is on political theory. Oh, wow. um, that's incredible! And, and and the future of 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 conservatism. So uh, anyway, we'll have to see how that does. So it's, yeah, it's an exciting I, time. Yeah, I mean, so like uh, with the uh, upcoming post at Princeton, I, I I don't know I don't know if you can talk much about it, but um, is it is it through the James Madison program or is it actually like you got okay, it. Yeah, nice. so uh, the, the position uh, is uh, research associate at the Department of Politics over there. Um, so, uh, so that's, that's next. Um, so it would be great to cross paths in person at some point. Oh, yeah. Wow. So, uh, Dr. Morello, we're talking today about your relationship with uh, Sir Roger Scruton and kind of your memories of him, but also his philosophy. And uh, we'll particularly hit on his... Um, his uh, political theory, aesthetics, and I think I also said I'd like to talk about just his views on religion as well. And so just to start off with, um, I remember last time you talked a little bit about your relationship with uh, uh, Sir Roger, but could you talk more about like, um, you know, how'd you first meet him? Uh, I, I think you met him as a student, is that correct? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, we first met when I was uh, an undergrad, um, and I was involved in a project called the Benedictus Liberal Arts Project, which was to encourage the study of uh, humane learning uh, in London. And, um, and in fact, we collaborated quite closely for a couple of years with um, Thomas More College of Liberal Arts up in New Hampshire, I think it is. Um, and so I, I had the privilege of teaching some of uh, the students um, fr from that college who came over to London um and roger was very keen to see this project flourish and each year we would organize a couple of colloquia um at which he would uh, give a talk um so i first met him when he was giving uh, an address on aesthetics actually um uh during one of our Benedictus colloquiums, uh, colloquia. Sorry, I need to, I need to get the fancy terminology right. Um, and he was, um, I, I mean, I just thought he was amazing. I, I, I remember, I, I hadn't had an experience like that listening to a philosophical lecture before. You know, I, I've got into philosophy because I thought it was terribly interesting. Um, uh, but there was something. Um, uh, sort of enchanting because um, you could tell that his pursuit to understand the meaning of of beauty and also the meaning that beauty bestowed upon uh, human life um, had been a deeply, deeply personal pursuit. Uh, so, um, you know, without getting too too soppy about the whole thing, you did you did get the 
the feeling that something of his own heart was being opened up to the audience as he spoke about um, uh, about beauty uh, and and the content of um, you know aesthetic analysis. So that's when I first met him. But I had already been an avid reader of his books uh, prior to that. Uh, that evening, I was fortunate to uh, join him and uh, a few other scholars um, for dinner at a, at a nearby restaurant. So uh, we were able to continue the discussion. Um, and of course, that's very much how my relationship remained, na namely one of sitting around a dinner table, um, because uh, Later, I decided to do the masters that he um, uh, he was the director of the masters program at the University of Buckingham. Uh, so I did I did my masters through that. He conducted um, that uh, entire program from a private dining room uh, at the Reform Club in Pall Mall. Um, and so, uh, what would tend to happen is. Um, a small number of his students, we would meet at the reform club, uh, we would go down into this private dining room, and then um, uh, either Roger or one of his friends, he, he'd often invite an, another academic, um, always a really kind of top class um, uh, academic, so it would be someone like um, you know, Simon May or Anthony O'Hare or, um, or Blackburn or so, someone like mm -hmm. that, uh, usually from the analytical tradition. Although May, of course, uh, is, is a great authority on the, on the continental, uh, tr tr modern continental tradition as well. Um, and he would, um, or, or Roger would give a lecture and then, and then we would have drinks, and then we would have this wonderful three-course meal together, uh, where during which we would discuss all these things. So he kind of um, he kind of brought us into deeper philosophy in the context of of the sort of Platonic symposium, I suppose. Um, uh, the risk of sounding a bit pompous, and um, and so so that was that was great. That's what he did, and then. Uh, at the end of the masters, he invited me to um, become one of his doctoral students. Wow. And so he supervised me uh, until his, his death in January last year. Um, so, uh, and then um, uh, he supervised me with an academic at Oxford University called uh, Andrew P uh, Pinsent, who um, who is a, a very good uh, Thomistic scholar, mm -hmm. um, and when Roger died, one of his closest friends, Alicia Gashinska, who is a great authority on the personalist tradition and uh, particularly that of uh, John Paul II and Max Scheler, she took over and sort of took up the baton so that I could finish off my my doctorate and did a really heroic job so that was my relationship with him and uh during the years um that I got to know him you know I mean certainly they were transformative years and uh because my doctorate focused on a kind of theocentric political vision um particularly concerned with the future of conservatism we were able to spend really the last 18 months of, of his life speaking pretty much exclusively about God, mm. um, which was which was great. And uh, uh, I went to his farm on a number of occasions. And when he would come to London, his uh, lodgings uh, just opposite uh, the Royal Academy, um, we would sit there. And he always managed wherever we were sitting, there was always a really, really good bottle of wine uh, not too far <laughs> away, um, which was just uh, a great way to learn. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, I'm very, I'm, I count myself extremely fortunate. Yeah. And how many years total was that, that you, that you got to know him and develop this friendship with him? 
Well, so I I first met him uh, nearly nearly a decade ago, mm, um, yeah. and then and then I was able to study with him over a, a three year period. Um, so that's that that was it really. Um, yeah, and, yeah. You know, at this, at this point too, like I'm wondering. Um, you know, I feel like I might have jumped the gun a little bit because some people might be wondering. You know, who is this Sir Roger Scruton that we're talking about, right? Right. I mean, uh, at this point, I, I would be surprised, but. Um, you know, uh, could you discuss just a little bit of, you know, some of Sir Roger's greatest achievements in his life and his academic work? Well, I can, I can, I can I'll do my best. I mean, one of the things about um, Roger is he excelled at many things. Mm -hmm. So he was a very great philosopher. He was particularly valued for his contribution on aesthetics and the philosophy of beauty. Um, he uh, spoke many languages. He uh, was a scholar of not only um, uh, cr Christian history and, and uh, theology, but also um, was could speak authoritatively on Islam, on uh, on Hindu texts as well. Uh, I, I remember he and I having one very, very long conversation about the content of the Bhagavad Gita, for example. Um, uh and i you know having read that uh, a couple of times like entered the conversation thinking ah oh, here's my opportunity to teach him a thing or two well that uh that confidence lasted about 30 seconds um and uh he was um uh he was also i suppose what people might be tempted to call a political activist in some ways um he was instrumental in uh, supporting uh, both intellectually and morally uh, many of the conservative movements in Eastern Europe. Um, he, uh, he set up secret universities uh, in the Soviet era um, in places like uh, the, what are, what's now the Czech Republic mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and in Poland. Um, I think he was also in, involved with... Um, certain initiatives in Romania as well. Um, uh, Viktor Orban of Hungary was at one point one of his students, for example. Um, and I was, uh, I, I think I was two pews behind Viktor Orban at Roger's funeral, actually. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. Well, Vic Viktor Orban and six enormous bodyguards. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, uh, and he was also, you know, he was a great um, outdoorsman, a, a great, a great man of the countryside, a great conservationist. He had a, a beautiful farm in Wiltshire. Um, he was an avid uh, hunter and, um, and and field sportsman. Um, a very committed family man. Uh, he, I mean, uh, the list goes on. Really, he was he was this incredibly expansive personality. He was trained uh, philosophically. He was trained in the in the analytic tradition. Um, and in fact, one of his um, one of his teachers and his doctoral supervisor was Elizabeth Anscombe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he, how, however, I I think really after um, he gained his doctorate. Uh, yes, I think it was after he he then became very interested in Kant and more broadly the continental tradition, and he um, sought to integrate a lot of Kantian and Hegelian perspectives into his analytic training, um, and and that was one of the one of the interesting things about talking to Roger. He was able to draw on many sources um, to create a wider conservative. Uh, account of um, of how we're going to make our way through this world, really, mm -hmm. to put it in, in, in the in the in the broadest way possible. Um, so I used to really enjoy uh, discussing Wittgenstein with him, for example. Um, and I think from the analytic tradition, uh, Wittgenstein was definitely the biggest influence on on Roger. Um, but I would say really uh, the philosophy of right and um, the, the Hegelian vision of settlement was and certainly the, the theme of alienation and how to overcome alienation 
was uh, a major influence on Rogers' more broader conservative vision, principally because, of course, Hegel begins with the family. Um, and uh, as, you, as I, no doubt you know, um, there are different schools of Hegelianism. And, and uh, of course, there's a, there's a Marxist account of Hegel. There's a, there's a fascist account of Hegel. Um, there is a, uh, and there's a conservative account of, of Hegel. Um, and the, the or, beginning from the settlement and the family in particular, this was obviously taken up to show how this was eschewed through um, this, this competitive class dynamic in the Marxist theory. Um, for, for the fascist, this was, this was a way of developing a kind of uh, blood and soil uh, narrative um but i think roger was able to uh develop a much more wholesome account of uh settlement and the overcoming of alienation um from his reading of hegel and and mark dooley who 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 is who is you know a very authoritative um interpreter of roger's works and worked very closely with roger certainly would argue uh, that he is the, the true son of Hegel. Wow. Um, but uh, anyway, the jury is out on all of that. But. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, like, just one thing that kind of occurred to me while you were talking was that uh, Sir Roger would often talk about in his lectures how, you know, he didn't come from a very prestigious background. Um, his father, I think, was, uh, they, were, they lived out in the English countryside. I think his father was a socialist. And um, his father had a great suspicion of academia. And yet, you know, Sir Roger went to grammar school um, and then he moved on into, uh, you know, I think it was Cambridge. That's where he went on for his uh, studies. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that really fascinated me, all the things that you said, like the, the rich life that he lived. I don't know if you have any comments on that, but. Um, well, well, certainly, I mean, we could touch on this a little bit um, when we talk about his aesthetics and his political theory. Mm -hmm. But certainly, um, despite the fact that, you know, Roger was, uh, I don't know, he really kind of joined the rural squirearchy with his farm <laughs> and his land and his horses, and he was mm -hmm. a, you know, a fox hunter and so on. Um, uh, he, he was never um, embarrassed by his, uh, how would you say, humble origins yeah. and uh and actually spoke a lot about his father spoke a lot about um what he thought was admirable in the old english uh socialist tradition um which is not the same as i mean you might argue that it's still not compatible with uh, a, a kind of catholic social doctrine approach uh which is probably true mm -hmm. um but the so the the old english socialist tradition isn't really the same as uh the kind of more continental uh tradition that that developed into bolshevism and so on you know it's it, the the uh, it, if um well a, a good way to be introduced to it is is to read the the essays of george orwell really um the 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 tradition of um, trying to protect your local spaces, of uh, your inherited architecture, of your shared parks, um, forms of activism like collecting signatures, um, you know, all of that was grew out of the old socialist tradition of, of saying that the people um, uh, are, are being attacked here in some way and actually... Um, you know they they, lay, uh, they have a moral claim to this or that and he, and and roger always had an admiration for that tradition and and one of the things that comes out very strongly in roger's writings is he didn't like snobbery yeah that's one of the reasons why he doesn't like um uh, modern uh, architectural forms on the whole uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, he is so suspicious of political programs that uh, seek to establish a kind of elite who can reorganize and restructure and engineer society for everyone else. 
this this uh, you know to to use a Voglinian uh, phrase you know th th this this kind of uh, moral Gnosticism was mm -hmm. something that um, Roger had a very very deep aversion to um, in fact a hostility towards. And I think that that largely grew out of, uh, or at least in the background to all of that, is um, is Roger's uh, own own social origins. But I, I wouldn't want to put it all down to that because a lot of a heck of a lot of thinking went into his conclusions. But but I think that's that's part of it anyway. Yeah, yeah, and then also just to, to mention this really quick before we move on into um, mm. well, I, I do have a, I, I do have an interesting question for you right after I, I say this. Uh, I think near the end of his life, he received kind of like uh, what would be the American equivalent of the like Medal of Freedom from I think it was the Czech Republic, right? Uh, yeah. Do you, do you, do you know all the details of that? It's kind of leaving me at the moment, but this was near uh, the end of his life when he was in a wheelchair and, and he received this wonderful award for. All the work he had done in Eastern Europe. Yeah, that's right. So um, when the when the whole place was um, uh, under the the Soviet terror, um, one of the things that uh, they were so keen to do was destroy any hint of local culture, of a sense of heritage, uh, a a um, uh, a national intellectual tradition, anything like that, was treated with with profound suspicion by the Soviet regime, because of course those things largely depend on the existence of borders and national distinction, uh, which is you know part of the Soviet program is to annihilate all borders and national distinction, and so um, so these things were incredibly hostile. Of course, the great irony is that that. The, these regimes claimed to be liberating the people from some oppressor. But of course, things like folk tradition, a national intellectual uh, distinct uh, tradition, um, uh, these things are actually the common possession of the people. These are not uh, something that that is uh, the possession of, of an elite or a, or a kind of... Um, exclusive bourgeois minority the, these are actually things that that are um you know it's on those that national distinction is is recognized in the first instance so um the, these people really felt that their entire inheritance and heritage was being stolen from them and they knew that the provided education, the provided tertiary education, and 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 so on, was was part of a kind of controlled propaganda machine, and so um, they found they looked for different ways um, uh, to 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 access their own inheritance, uh, particularly their intellectual heritage. So these wonderful. English academics led by Roger and Roger was just brilliant at bringing all sorts of people together. There's a, there's a great article that was recently, uh, I don't know if it was in Unheard or it was, it, you'll find it online written by um, Jess, Jessica Douglas Hume, mm. who was a very close friend of, of Roger's and did a lot of similar work in Romania. Um, she, she describes this time in Roger's life and just how, uh, you know, energetic and committed he was um, to, to, to these people uh, for whom he had so much sympathy. Um, and so, and, and of course, a lot of those people were able to uh, in part rebuild their societies once the, the Soviet terror was, was, was over. And, and, and those people became important politicians. And so uh, they've always been keen to, to thank uh, Roger for his work. And, um, and this culminated, yes, in the reception of this award. One of the strange things about Roger was that he was really, really loved um, everywhere except England. <laughs> um, it, it, it's one of those strange things. He was so, he was, he so loved his 
own country. He so loved England. He understood the common law very deeply. He, he, he loved our rural way of life. He loved our institutions. Um, he was, uh, you know, a very impressive amateur historian, you could say, of, of um, uh, to, to use the old phrase, our island story. Um, and yet uh, he was really vilified for it um, uh, by people he would describe as oikophobes, um, haters of their own home. Um, but he was loved everywhere else. He, was lo he, he did very well in the United States. He was loved uh, in the United States. He was loved on the continent. Um, he's loved in, there's a big Scrutonian following in places like Brazil and Chile. Um, he, he was, uh, yes. I think I think um, I think our Lord had something to say about prophets and homes. Anyway, yeah, um, uh, that that just came to mind actually. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, so moving on to his philosophy now. Um, personally, I remember when I first encountered Sir Roger Scruton, and it was kind of by accident. So this was after um, for a while I'd been a democratic socialist and a progressive Christian. And then I finally kind of stopped and asked myself, why did I believe the things that I was believing? And, it, it, you know, it was a time of serious study in scripture, but also in philosophy. And um, after I made the decision to become conservative or to drop my, my old beliefs, I remember I felt as if I was in a spiritual wasteland because, you know, I lost a lot of friends. I had to kind of rebuild my life and figure out what, what do I believe now, you know? And I remember I stumbled across Why Beauty Matters you know, the BBC documentary that Sir Roger hosted. And I remember I listened to just the way he talked about beauty and, uh, you know, and, and all this, and I was just so blown away. And then I saw someone say, wow, he, in the comment section on YouTube, you know, this is like the greatest conservative philosopher alive today. And I was like, how can he, I didn't know that conservatives could talk like this, you know, uh, about beauty and about um, you know, our inheritance as a Christian civilization. And it was just, it was wonderful. And so I want to ask you, um, Dr. Morello, um, for Roger, for Sir Roger's philosophy, do you think that it's more fundamental to start with his aesthetics or his political philosophy? Where should we begin when we think about the life and mind of Sir Roger? Gosh, that's... Um... Certainly it was aesthetics for which he was best known. Mm-hmm um his his political works he wrote a lot of very uh good books on aesthetics very, very hard books on aesthetics the the aesthetics of architecture and the yeah. aesthetics of music are are very hard books um uh his political philosophy i think was written for um for a bigger audience um and and that and therefore he he worked hard to make sure that they were not as quite as as demanding um uh that i mean they're they're extremely clever books but they they i think they're they're more accessible um and i think that had to do with the fact that again this goes back to his his view of an aesthetic vernacular and um and and let's to put it differently, his aversion to snobbery when it came to beauty. Um, whereas, so 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 for him, he thought that beauty was something that we all just kind of knew when we saw it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why beauty is is so um, so difficult to define. And uh, its corruptions are so beautiful, uh, are so difficult to define. You know, um, uh, ugliness and kitsch and these things are very, very difficult. Uh, largely because they're the th they're, they're almost kind of the prior commitments that we have before we start defining things, right? So, so it's it, so it, beauty was not the thing that was so much. Um, in danger, apart from the fact that there were a lot of wealthy people who were putting a lot of time and technology and effort into covering uh, our landscape with ugly things, um, uh, like uh, big brutalist, um, you know, 
concrete blocks and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, whereas politics was was a bit more difficult um, because we we kind of live in this in this technocratic world um, in which you know I, I was told um, as a young boy I was told this is what the state is um, the state is a power with which you have made a contract yeah and you have um you have all these innate powers but you've given them up or at least let's say half of them and you've handed those over to the state so that the state can do those things because certain privileges come well that's kind of that's this kind of nice great as a as a as a um as a concept, as a pure abstraction, it doesn't really tell me anything about how I've lived my life in this community, about the inherited institutions, about the kind of commitments of civil society and um, our, my shared way of being. It also gives an account of me as a radical individual. It doesn't really explain the kind of relationship I enjoy with my family, the kind of uh, relationship I enjoyed as a baby with my parents, and that I now enjoy with my, with my, with my children. Um, and it doesn't really explain any of the kind of moral feelings I have towards fulfilling the imperatives imposed on me by the state, right? Which don't seem purely contractual at all, particularly when it comes to the kinds of the, the kind of pieties like patriotism for which I might even give up my life altogether. And I know that any contract that would require that of me would be a contract I would never sign in the first place. So, so we're talking about something completely outside the realm of contractual agreements when we're talking about the state and the moral entity of which the state is comprised, namely civil society. Now, Roger did think that most people didn't really understand this. And it's not that they... Um, uh, it's not that they misunderstood the various theories that were available to them regarding the state. Most people don't think about them, but they kind of get them by osmosis. What he thought was that most people did not think seriously about the prior commitments that they have, the ones that we were just talking about, the prior commitments that they have, which render the functioning of the state intelligible at all. And so, and so that's that's really what I think um, Roger was trying to do. So, so, and he would ask questions when he was developing his own political thought. He would ask questions like, "What do we actually mean by a home?" Mm. Right. This is the this is the interesting thing. You take you take for example the Lockean model that that I loosely just described and and that is that has kind of become enshrined as the the sacred model of political thought for for many people in the united states it doesn't really tell you about what a home is neither the totally sovereign autonomous individual um he doesn't need a home and he's certainly not entering into a contract with the state in order to have a home. It's rather an exchange of rights. Yeah. But but um, but that doesn't correspond. Ironically, in the American case, doesn't correspond to your your kind of founding myth at all, right? Uh, it do, it doesn't matter which founding myth you choose, whether you're talking about the Pilgrim Fathers turning up or your or the signing of uh, of your constitution or anything like that. In it in the end. Um, this is all an attempt to try and describe why people came to the new world to make a home. Um, so it's, it's one of the strange things that the Lockean idea has become so, uh, you know, so important in the, in, in, in the American mind, when it doesn't actually account for why the American civilization, you, you know, grew up in in the first place so these were the kinds of questions that roger wanted to ask and they're the kinds of questions that we're all asking whether implicitly or explicitly 
We're not, uh, you have to come up with sophisticated mechanisms of contractual agreements in order to create this abstract state. Most people are not thinking like that at all. Mm -hmm. they're, thought, they're thinking, okay, so what's going to be best for my children? How are they going to live? You know, how are they going to be secure, right? How am I going to secure my my religious liberties? Am I, are they going to be, am I going to catechize them for the next 10 years just so they can, uh, you know, lose their faith on the first day of university? You know, that, that, those are the kinds of questions they're asking, the, the questions of coming home. So, uh, yes, that, that I think, uh, I don't know is the answer regarding an introduction into Rogers' works. Mm -hmm. It depends what you're interested in, but certainly his political thought is a more approachable a place to start, that's for sure. But of course, he did write introductions to philosophy as well. Um, uh, introductions to particular philosophers. He wrote a book called The German Philosophers, looking at particularly the, the Romantic Ger German philosophers. He wrote a very, very dense introduction to Kant. Um, and he wrote an, an absolutely enormous uh, magisterial work um, called uh, Modern Philosophy. Um, which, uh, you know, if you want an introduction to modern philosophy with a Scrutonian take, then that is the that is certainly the place to go. Yeah, that's wonderful. And um, yeah, so it's interesting then that you mentioned that, um, you know, you don't have to really with Roger, you could you could go into his philosophy, uh, his political philosophy, or you could go into his aesthetics but it, it was accessible if you went to the political philosophy, you didn't have to first understand a lot. And, and that kind of goes to show his desire to make his work accessible. Um, and so uh, one, thing that, uh, one thing that occurred to me, if, if I can remember it properly, um, oh, a lot of what you were saying reminded me of like what he talks about and how to be a conservative, where he mentions the smaller platoons of society as uh, Edmund Burke put it. And so I'm interested on, do you, do you know at all like how he, how he first encountered Edmund Burke and the extent to which he, that influenced him. I mean, I know it influenced him immensely, um, but uh, you know, uh, how did he encounter that? And also um, how faithful would you say he was as a Burkean? Well, that is a, that's a, oh, that's a really, the second question is tough. So the first <laughs> question, when did he encounter? I, um, he talks about his encounter with the writings of Edmund Burke in his autobiographical work, uh, Gentle Regrets. And I believe um, it was when he was professor of aesthetics at Birkbeck in London, um, which was kind of the first stint of his academic career. Um, which he which he kind of destroyed, and then uh, I think by writing um, Thinkers of the New Left, yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, when he really at attacked in a in a I think a rather charitable way, but it wasn't interpreted that uh, like that at the time. Uh, attacked the sacred cows of, of kind of <laughs> Marxist uh, philosophy um, or progressivist philosophy. Um, so. And then, and then he um, he managed to kind of slowly rebuild his academic career again. And then he wrote *Sexual Desire*, um, which you know took took things like perversion seriously and and criticised. Uh, um, di didn't see everything as just uh, n neutral sexual choices, but but subjected sexual desire to a moral critique mm -hmm. which uh also didn't win him any friends <laughs> so um uh now i think that it was at birkbeck when he was surrounded by um hyper progressive and marxist uh you know hu humanities professors um and he said that there was there there, as far as he could tell, there were only two conservatives in the university. Um, there was Roger, mm -hmm. and um, there was the, the lady behind the, the checkout in the canteen, um, who, who um, al always kept uh, a little picture of John Paul II on her. Um, Beautiful. And, mm -hmm. and he, he, he said that uh, he thought that they were the only two conservatives there, so they sort of, try, you know, 
console each other with a five minute conversation every day. Um, and, um, and it was during that time that he looked around for people who shared his thoughts about what it was to be human really and what it was to establish a community you have to remember that conservatism is is not according to roger and i i, I wholly agree with him conservatism is not really something you you think yourself into naturally um you can think yourself into conservatism uh i know that john stuart mill said that you know conservatism was the stupid man's option um uh and again you know that that is um that is just the kind of snobbery that roger detested because it, that may be true uh, by the way that it might be the stupid man's option <laughs> um but just because conservatism is obvious to stupid people that's not sufficient to say it's wrong or, or untrue um, so to, to just simply point out that un, unintelligent people are attracted to conservatism doesn't actually tell you anything about the veracity of the conservative attitude. It simply uh, just points out the snobbery of the person who, who advances that point. Mm. Um, and now, uh, conservatism um, is primarily, according to Roger, and I agree, it, it is attitudinal. And so um, conservatives... Th thinking conservatives what they tend to do is just have certain prior commitments and assumptions about how how we should treat one another how we should look at the world um the kind of ways that we should build environments um you know often it's to do with I know this sounds a bit sort of trite, but often it's to do with things like courtesy and tact and politeness. Um, you know, uh, let's build a let's build a beautiful uh, environment, for example, and and be very sensitive to received forms because we just don't want to annoy the people we live with. You know, um, it, so so uh, it's this kind of attitudinal um, stance, and then what thinking conservatives tend to do is look around for reasons why they might have those sorts of attitudinal commitments. And I think that's what Roger did at Birkbeck. It was being surrounded by quite aggressive Marxists and progressives that made him think, well, why do I think this way? So, and the obvious thing to do was to, to, to read, um, Burke's reflections on the revolution in France, which he did, he says in Gentle Regrets, he found transformative. And the reason he found it transformative is because what Burke does, and this is this is why, if any of your more, you know, Thomistic listeners are are, are uh, they might want to lean in on this. Well, one of the things that Burke does, in my view, is he heals modern Thomists. Um, now, I know that, that, that there are people who are going to feel uncomfortable with this, but um, Thomas Aquinas was not a, um, a, a rationalist. But if you live in an age after and conditioned by rationalism, you can very easily read rationalism into Aquinas. And there are a lot of Thomists that do this. And what Burke does is he, um, he prioritizes the real, the established, the existential, the existent. That's what Burke does. He is, he is the most anti-rationalist philosopher that I think you can, you can find. And it, my experience was that um, uh, I, I very easily reading Aquinas, which is my undergraduate background, um, reduced a lot of Thomistic schemas into these uh, monolithic abstract systems. 
And, and it was reading Burke and studying under Roger that kind of healed me of this. And then when I go back to read Aquinas, I realized that actually what Aquinas is doing is he's using conceptual techniques to render intelligible the concrete realities uh, of, of, say, what it is to be human, what it is, uh, and not what it is to be human in an abstract sense, but really um, uh, the day-to-day uh, living out of of of, of uh, what's entailed by human nature, which is of course why Aquinas is so so so, so centered on the virtues, uh, why he devotes so much to the virtues. Um, now, I, I think that this is what so so now whether you're coming from the Thomistic background or you're coming from the analytical background or you're coming from uh, a continental background. Either way, you are going to be, because you're modern, uh, not you, but one, is going to be uh, deeply, deeply conditioned by, by an overly rationalist, overly left brain way of, of understanding reality. And that's why all modern people need to read Burke, because, because Burke is like medicine for that, mm. um, for that condition. And I think that this is what Roger found. He, when he read Burke, he found a philosopher who was prioritizing the existent, the established, the received, the historically conditioned, etc. And thereafter, all of his thought um, prioritized, uh, prioritized that and didn't fall into these monolithic um, abstract schemas um, of which philosophers are so frequently guilty. So that I think is the the importance of Burke for him and for us all, really. And speaking of which, I think it'd be worthwhile to just talk about some of the controversies that occurred in Sir Roger's life. Obviously, one of the earliest was when he published Thinkers of the New Left. And I mean, I remember he talked about just how horrendous the time was after when the work was received and you know, he got hate mail and, and all of that. And his his uh, integrity as an academic was questioned. I think he mentions this uh, in his kind of updated version of that book in Fools, Frauds and uh, Firebrands. Um, and uh, and then there was also the time in which, uh, what was it? There's the character assassination attempt on him near the end of his life. Uh, I, I forget um, which journalist it was exactly, but some of his comments about um, the, about China were taken out of context. And then also some of his comments, or well, rather, um, his views on on sexual morality did come back to haunt him in a way, um, especially, I can't remember who, I think maybe it was the same journalist who brought that up or something like that. But I mean, could you talk about those controversies that occurred in Sir Roger's life and also um, when he was very unfairly, uh, this, uh, he lost his job, right? And the, um, I forget what the, pro, what the, uh, what the, office was exactly called but it had to do with architectural renewal uh in in england yeah so um he was always getting himself into trouble that's for (laughs) sure and um uh i remember some of his old friends uh at his funeral reception saying we always warned him you know he would send us stuff and they would say look you've got you're gonna have to tone this down a bit before you you publish it and he would always say no, no no look i know what i'm doing here you know don't worry and and it's not obvious he always did know what he was doing because um he was nearly always quite surprised by the backlash uh no matter how much he was uh, he had been warned and it um very often made him very sad oh. um and he used to joke and say, well, you know, being hated by liberals and progressives is, is, is you know, a mark of honour for me or whatever. But actually, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, he used to say that more in his younger days. Um, he, 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 as I think everyone does, you know, he calmed as he got older and everything. But, but he, um, it, it, did, it did tend to make him sad and at times it was very serious uh, after the the backlash he got after publishing things of the new left uh, you know and I'm not saying anything secret here he was public about this uh, it, he went through a time of um, you know feeling suicidal um, he, his, ent- his entire career had been destroyed and he um, uh, he had academics he had worked with 
you know, for over a decade, calling up the publisher and telling them to not publish it. And, you know, it was very, um, and he, you know, essentially got hounded out of the country, really. He, he, he had to try and reconstruct something of an academic career on the other side of the Atlantic. So that was tough. Um, he was, he was always getting himself into trouble, but um, the, the, the incident in the last year of his life that, that you mentioned in the New Statesman uh, interview, that was really a shocking, uh, Eaton, that was his name, George Eaton was, mm. the, the, um, uh, was the journalist. I mean, journalist is is not considered a very noble profession anymore. Um, but I don't think he's even really worthy of of that title, frankly. But um, because it wasn't journalism, it was it was just a it was just the kind of crudest possible hit job, really, mm -hmm. where um, he he misconstrued much of what Roger said, and then he, uh, in fact, all of what Roger said, and uh, and then eventually, I think his I think his devices were hacked and the original interview was actually released on a, on youtube i think it was and and everyone saw but by that point what was amazing was that the conservative party in this country um and uh the the name conservative party must be understood ironically i think um because the conservative party just it simply does not advance uh in any anything that can be described as conservative policy, um, the Conservative Party uh, in this country, uh, its members, many, nearly all of its members, uh, who who took note of the situation, all fell over one another to publicly denounce Roger um, to show how 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 progressive they they really were. They took it as an opportunity to to signal um, their their liberalism and so they all came out uh, and denounced roger um and and it wasn't really the hit job and the lying and the trust he had put in this journalist because of course roger had been the wine writer for the new statesman for years and so he had this historical relationship with this newspaper and thought that even though it is a very liberal newspaper there is a relationship of trust there and they wouldn't do anything to so so um, he perhaps naively trusted this journalist to respect the relationship he had always had with the with the the newspaper that was now uh, employing um, George Eaton, um, which he didn't. And so um, it, he it was it wasn't any of that stuff. It was the fact that Roger had spent decades giving some serious intellectual support to the Conservative Party in this country and was really the only serious intellect out there who was doing that. Um, uh, there's a long history of British academics being deeply committed to, uh, um, to, to the uh, Liberal Democrat and Labour Party. The Labour Party is the historically English Socialist Party. There's a long tradition of that. There is very, very little tradition of, uh, in fact, pretty much non-existent, uh, of um, intellectuals and scholars, you know, being committed to the cause of the Conservative Party in this country. And Roger did that. And at the moment when they could have said, they could have come out and said, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. We're not convinced that Roger said these things or we think this has been misconstrued or whatever. We're, we're, we're not going to make any judgment and we're certainly not going to sack him from the post that he's been given mm -hmm. um, until we uh, have the actual recording of the interview. They could have done that. That would have been a totally reasonable thing to, to do. By the way, the post that he said uh, that he had, I, I should explain, was um, that of a governmental advisor on their building scheme. So um, recently, much of the English countryside has been covered in uh, new um, building developments. And 
um, you know, they, they, they kind of take place on the old Roman model, which is essentially instead of people moving to an area and the building slowly growing up as, as it used to happen throughout most of Europe in, um, in, in a much more organic way, these building schemes is to purchase a plot of land, build a load of uh, red brick buildings onto that land and then move people uh, into those areas. That's what tend to happen. Now, uh, Roger's view was, if you're going to do that, you still have to learn from your ancestors. So you still need to, you know, look at how people built Bath, for example, the Georgians built Bath, for example. They're using local stone, they're using classical forms and so on. They're, they're, they're attentive to, to the aesthetic vernacular. And, um, and if you do that, then if you're going to build on the English countryside, at least you're not building ugly buildings on the English mm -hmm. countryside. You're building the people, it's a delight to arrive there, you know. Um, so, uh, and of course, Leon Crea, the, the architect that did such superb work in, in uh, I think, Dorset, I think, that, um, who, you know, modern building planning, but, um, but very attentive to classical forms and the Western tradition of aesthetics. You know, that's what Roger was trying to do, and he was trying to encourage the government to do some top-down work to ensure that if we're going to build new, we build beautiful. Um, Roger was doing this in a purely voluntary capacity, by mm -hmm. the way. So this was an enormous amount of time and effort um, that he put into doing something merely because he thought it was good to do it. Um, and it was very good for the Conservative government to say that they were committed to making not just new housing, but beautiful housing for people. Um, and, and, and so they fired him from this purely voluntary capacity. And I, I would go uh, so far as to say, I think that that's what killed him, mm. actually. I think that um, uh, this, he was, he was ravaged with uh, cancer. He had cancer in the bones. He had uh, um, uh, primary cancer um, elsewhere. He was, he was absolutely ravaged with, uh, with cancer, but I think it started with this incredible shock and stress and distress that he was put through, where the very people in the party whom he had sought, sought to to support and and put enormous amount of time and effort uh, for nothing um, uh, into into building up. Uh, these people had all fallen over themselves to publicly denounce him at the first moment. Um, it was it was really one of the most uh, shocking things, and um, and so I think you know in the end the Conservative Party, um, which Roger had done so much for, uh, was really um, largely behind his, his pre premature death. Um, so it's a very, it's a very, very sad story. It's a very tragic story. Um, and, uh, the sad, the, perhaps the saddest thing is, is, uh, is it could have served as some kind of lesson for the Tories, but I don't think so. Um, yeah. And I guess now the, I hope I haven't depressed you too much with that. No, 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 no. I mean, like you asked. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And also, uh, you know, the truth is the truth, right? And so I think it's worth knowing that. Um, and, and that kind of brings me now into the, in the topic of religion. And I think this will be kind of a good final few questions to ask. But wow, like when you said that you talked to him about religion for what was it you said uh, for a, a few months? Um, yeah, well, re I mean, really, that was what we talked about for the last two years of his life, I suppose, mm. or maybe 18 months. I mean, that was... We talked about it constantly, um, and he he always used to say, "You must find a way of saying these things without sounding like a fanatic." <laughs> that was <laughs> that was always his advice. He always knew that the moment you you stepped onto religious territory, you either sounded like a kind of soppy liberal who was um, subjecting all. Uh, religious commitments to modern criticism, or you sounded like a kind of, you know, 
Christian Taliban or something, you know, you see, you, <laughs> and so, so he was, he was very sensitive to this need to convey religious insights in a way that sounded reasonable. Yeah. So, so yeah, sorry, you had, you had, a, you had a, do you have any questions about? Uh, yeah, this? well, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, one thing I'm interested in is the content of those conversations over the two years, but second, um, in, in particular, I know this is a tough question to answer, but let me pitch it to you anyway, because I haven't I, I haven't gone easy on you anyway, you know, with these tough questions. So did Roger Scruton, um, did Sir Roger Scruton believe in the Christian God? So first, the content of the conversations that you had, and then second, did Sir Roger Scruton believe in the Christian God? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and I, th I, I, I do rather feel that it's just above my pay grade. Yeah. Um, frankly, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I think last time you and I spoke, we talked about the funeral service that he had chosen to compile, um, and uh, certainly. Would be difficult to, to see why someone of no Christian faith would pick such texts, such readings, such hymns. Uh, I don't think they were picked purely for aesthetic reasons. Um, it, this is what I would say about this. Okay, mm -hmm. um, there are. Roger was very interested in the personalist tradition. Um, this was one of the things that he wanted, that he very much added to his own analytic training. He's very interested in the personalist tradition. He read a lot of Shaler. He read a lot of Dietrich von Hildebrand. He read a lot of Wojtyla. Uh, and he read a lot of Buber. Um, and his last three in my view, the the last books that he read that I think should uh, wrote, sorry, that I think should be read as 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 um, interpretive keys for his much broader thought um, are the face of God, yeah. soul of the world, mm -hmm. and on human nature. Yeah, that's those are the three that I was thinking about. Yeah. Right. These are these are like absolutely amazing books. And I really hope that, you know, because he's read as a political philosopher and he's read as a philosopher of aesthetics. And that's great. But I really hope that in the, the coming years, people will really focus on these books. And, and I think by doing so, they will understand much more of it. And I hope they also read his um you know his his literature as well i hope they read read his novels and things because i think these are very important for understanding his his wider thought anyway going back mm -hmm. um it's in those books that you that, that you see his personalist philosophy coming to the foreground and um i often used to think of booba when he and i were discussing uh, God and um, the content of religion together. Um, and the reason I often used to think of Buber is because there's an interesting section in the third chapter of I and Thou, in which Buber says, there are people who are very much convinced that they are religious believers, but they have a purely instrumental conception of God. They don't understand how they are supposed to relate to God beyond um, this kind of, I mean, he doesn't use this phrase, but let's, let's, this kind of massive candy machine, you know, you turn to God when you are in need, you don't really think of him otherwise. And, um, and so, uh, that's the relationship that you have with God. That, it, that is a contractual relationship. I will offer these prayers, and in return, I expect these effects, right? That is a contractual relationship with God, which is, for Buber, a completely inappropriate relationship. 
A contractual relationship, by the way, is the relationship that most of the people have with God, whom uh, the Israelites encounter. Um, the 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 prophets of Baal, uh, whom uh, Elijah um, uh, competes with, um, they have a contractual relationship with their God, for example. Um, if you have a contractual relationship with God, it's probably not God you're talking about. It's probably an idol. Buber thinks that there is no, and, and Aquinas agrees, by the way. In fact, Aquinas got there first. Um, uh, Buber thinks that idolatry is the greatest evil. Uh, it's the greatest possible evil. Now, um, then Buber goes on to say, there are some people who think they are not religious believers, but they sit at their window at night and they stare out into the darkness and they address the darkness as you. They're not asking for anything in return. They're just crying out to someone who is in some way behind and accounts for everything that they see, or all appearances in the world. And their heart cries out to that person, not expecting anything in return, only pursuing a unitive experience. Buber says, I would be inclined to say that the true religious believer is the second person. Now, this, I think, is a way of understanding Roger's religious attitude. In one sense, you can say he was definitely Christian, because in the strictest possible sense, he was baptised. He attended church every Sunday. He played the organ in his local church every Sunday. Did he believe in the Christian God? He certainly believed in God. Um, he used to des describe himself as um, having the Christian faith without any of its consolations. However you want to interpret that, uh, you are free. Um, I really, I, I'm afraid I'm grasping about in the dark here. It's very difficult to, to speak to this uh, question. This, the, the final thing I'll say on this, and it goes back to the, the Buber's point and the, the personalist tradition. Um, whenever Roger was happy to talk about God and the content of religion and religious commitments, but whenever you asked him a direct question about his own religious belief, he became embarrassed. Mm. And I don't think that it's because he had nothing to say. But I think that he felt that the question was a little bit like asking a man how his relationship with his wife is. It's so intimate um, that it is just a little bit embarrassing to talk about that. It's interesting that St. Paul, for example, um, when he talks about the intimacy of his own relationship with God, he pretends he's talking about somebody else. Mm. Right? I know of a man who was taken up and who saw God face to face and so on. He, he says this. Now, the fathers always interpreted this as St. Paul talking about himself. But in some way, it 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 it, it, it it emancipates you from the embarrassment of dealing with this when you can pretend you're talking about somebody else. And, and, and so that I think, and, 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 and Roger always found the question, um, you know, what's, what's your faith like? What's your relationship with God? These sorts of questions, he always found these deeply embarrassing. Mm. Um, and I, and I, I think it's for that reason. So I think, that, I, I think that's all I can say about that really. Um, I hope that's enough. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's totally fine. And and, and wow, that's such a I, I mean, I think that's a very refreshingly mature way of viewing 
one's relationship with God. It's not something to be talked about lightly, regardless of where you are in your particular walk. And, you know, when you, when you talked about how he, he held to the Christian faith, but it didn't have any of its consolations, you know, I think it seems as if Roger did have, Sir Roger did have a very complicated relationship with God. Um, and just speaking a little bit from just what I've seen, you know, I, I remember he said somewhere in an interview that he wasn't terribly concerned about an afterlife or, or something like that, or he said he was content with this life. And it, it got me thinking about like, you know, well, the, you know, the suffering that he might have endured in his life. Maybe he was kind of like in a state like, you know, Mother Teresa, you know, like um, to compare him to a saint. But, um, you know, he he had a hard time. He, he knew that there was real beauty to the world. He knew that, at least intellectually speaking, there was a God, as you as you put it. But the bridge between that and his own heart was something that still needed to be dealt with. And so I think that I think that we'll have to wait and see, you know, how it all turned out. But I remember um, I'll, sh I'll share this one last detail with you. So I remember at the end of Sir Roger's life, I sent him an email when I was 16. I sent him my first email and I said, you know, Sir Roger, thank you so much for your work. And um, so on and so forth. And I asked him if he, if he had ever written a love story because the way he wrote, I just found so romantic and beautiful. And he said, oh yeah, you know, I did write a, a love story called Notes from the Underground, you know? And then he, uh, uh, at the end of his email, he said, thank you so much. You're, you're, the, you're so young and yet you're still a fan of my work. I, you know, he loved it. And then I emailed him another time when I graduated from high school, asking him if he would come to my graduation party. And I knew that it was kind of like, you know, like who, you know, a guy, uh, an intellectual from Britain coming to my party in Kansas, you know, like I, I knew it was kind of futile, but it was kind of a, a gesture of kindness, right? And he said, Oh, Swan, I'm so honored that you invited me, but I'm afraid I can't make it. You know, I'll be giving a lecture tour somewhere. And then he said, You know, maybe we'll meet uh, when I'm giving a, a tour through, Can uh, you know, through uh, the East Coast or whatever, you know. And so he kind of left out that possibility. And then when I got the news that he died or that he was dying from cancer, I sent him a final email thanking him for everything. And, you know, I talked a little bit about religion and I told him about how he helped me become Catholic. And I want to read to you um, his final email to me. So Sir Roger said, Dear Swan, thank you so much for your kind and heartwarming email, which means a lot to me. It was very kind of you to respond in this way and you helped to increase my courage in facing this illness. Your prayers are truly important to me and I thank you for them and for all your good will. With kindest regards, Roger Scruton. And let me actually pull that up on the screen right there. Yeah, that was the last email that we had. And as you know, Sir Roger died on January 12th. That was the same day that uh, Edmund Burke was born. And that was the same day that I was born. And so the same day that I was celebrating my birthday, I was also celebrating the loss of a good friend, but yeah, wouldn't trade that friendship for the world, even if it was just over email. Well, I'm really grateful to you for, for sharing that with me. That's, that's really, um, that's very touching. Um, I suppose it, uh, it's, it might be better to, to end on that, but I, 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 uh, <laughs> I just say um, one thing about his remark that he's happy with this world. Uh, yeah. Um, dur during our conversations, he and I spoke a lot because we were talking about theocentric accounts of uh, political establishment. Um, we talked a lot about the Augustinian vision. And he told me that he found this uh, very helpful because he had always been slightly nervous about um, a, a, what could be interpreted as the Christian view. Obviously, it's a, a caricature, but what could be interpreted as the Christian view, that this world is simply a passing thing. And that, um, you know, the, the, the really important life is what happens once you, once you die. And we talked a lot about the the fact that, you know, at the eschaton, it's this world, not another world that must be redeemed um, and glorified. Um, but 
nonetheless, that's going to happen whether or not you make it beautiful or not uh, now. Um, and he thought that uh, there was something, that one, there was something about that vision that certainly uh, did, made it incompatible with much Christian material culture anyway, um, because Christians invest so much time and effort into making beautiful uh, architecture and beautiful um, beautiful art and music and literature and, and so on, uh, or at least we did once upon a time, we're not very good at it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but also um, that there was, that there was a, an overly pessimistic attitude attached to that view that really could um, end in, 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 in failing to see what's lovable about this life and this world. Um, and this was what, what worried him about the, the Christian pursuit of the life to come. Now, in the Augustinian vision, um, for Augustine, this world is the first tier is the first sphere, if you like, mm -hmm. of either heaven or hell, depending on whether you're saved or damned. If you're saved, then you have to make this the first tier of heaven. You've got to build massive, beautiful cathedrals. You've got to create a liturgical polity. You've got to cover the place in art and beautiful architecture, wonderful marbles. You've got to, um, you've got to build hospitals and universities. You've got to live fully of the life of charity. You've got, you've got to raise the poor up from the from suffering. You've got to do all of this, and you've got to do it in this world because you're already establishing the first tier of heaven. Likewise. If this is the first uh, tier of hell, then you're going to manifest that in this world, and it's and 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 your life is going to be disordered and it's going to be chaotic, and and that's why the moral life isn't just simply finger wagging at bad acts. You know, the 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 an immoral life is actually a tragedy um, mm -hmm. because um, it's 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 simply the manifestation of your interior life and that's why it's 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 uh indicative of something really tragic going on and why grace needs to enter and redeem it and and and, and bring you into the kingdom of christ and that's why the augustinian vision of um the city of man or city of appetite and the city of god the city of god isn't what exists in heaven the city of god is um the assumption of this world once it's been consecrated and filled with grace into the the liturgical life that's ever going on in heaven and so talking about that suddenly uh, i think uh, roger found this kind of augustinian vision very uh a very, a very beautiful um and uh and i would i would say that in his own life that's what he was trying to do you know when i visited him uh, on on the occasions i did at at his farm uh in wiltshire he had created this space that had a a if it's not an over equivocation on the word it had a kind of sacred feeling to it you know it was a place of contemplation a place of study um a place of noble pursuits and um and he, he had found a little patch of a little rural county and he had redeemed it um and i think again to go back to the the last point that was indicative of uh, uh an illustrative of his interiority um mm -hmm. uh, which was again manifested in the in the in the final crisis of his life when he was treated so badly and there was a very it was looking like um uh george eaton was going to be sacked from his post um for for for, for his outrageous behavior and um roger came out and said this he you know this cannot happen to him mm. um it is it is not acceptable um that two lives are ruined uh, my life has been ruined by this. Uh, one life ruined is enough. Uh, it, it, uh, and and Roger said, I I completely forgive him for 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 this. 
uh, and I hope that he he's able to go on and make a success of his life. That was Roger's attitude um, uh, toward uh, this person who had so mistreated him. So um, if that is not uh, in, in indicative of uh, the life of of infused charity, uh, I don't know what is. So anyway, that's wow. That's my my closing comment. Yeah, well, Dr. Morello, I'm glad that you said that because I think that's just the perfect way to close out the interview with um with just hope and happiness and beauty. I think that's the way that we ought to live. And so, uh, Dr. Morello, thank you so much for coming on to my show again. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Yeah, and once you get your book published, uh, I'd love to have you back on to talk about it. Sure, absolutely.